And uh, just through uh, a quick reminder, members of the public, as a committee, we understand that the matters under consideration tonight can be emotive. However, I do ask that you uh, respect uh, those around you and the committee throughout. Please refrain from booing, cheering, or any other form of disturbance. Can I just introduce, for the benefit of the uh, webcast, the officers in front of me? On, the, on my left, Elizabeth Sims, head of uh, planning at Waverley. Tim Bryson, senior planning officer. Peter Cleveland, head of development control. Um, Barry Devlin, our lawyer. So we move on to the business of the meeting. Minutes of the meeting that took place on the 15th of March have been laid on the table for the last 30 minutes. I contend I sign those as a true record. Thank you. Emma, apologies for absence. Uh, we've received apologies from councillors John Gray, Nick Holder, David Hunter, Kevin Dinas, Chris Storey, John Ward, Morris Byam and Christian Hesse. Thank you. And uh, moving on, uh, members, uh, before the meeting, have there been any declared interest? Uh, none before the meeting, Chairman. Any other members? No. Moving on, uh, item four, question from members of the public. Have there been any, Emma? Uh, none received, Chairman. Thank you. Moving on to five, then. This is WA 2016-1261, erection of 61 new dwellings, including nine affordable and a 60-bed care home provision of a suitable alternative natural green space, a saying, alterations to access and associated works following demolition of the existing buildings at former Weyburn Bartlett uh, Works, Shackleford Road, Elstead. And Peter is going to introduce this item, followed by Tim to go through the presentation. Thank you, Peter. Yes, thank you, Chairman. Uh, yeah, before Tim takes you through the, the details of the application, I'll firstly take you, through a key, uh, take you through a few key points um, to assist in the consideration of the application um, before you tonight. So this is a detailed application um, seeking permission for the construction of 61 new dwellings and a 60-bed care home. As such, the principal development, as well as all matters of detail, are to be considered. Members will be aware that planning permission has recently been granted at appeal for a larger housing scheme of 69 dwellings and a 60-bed care home on the site. Uh, as you'll see, the, the appeal decision is attached to a report update for ease of reference, as this decision was received following the completion of the officer report. Um, but it is, of course, a highly material consideration in the determination of this application, and the, con and the key conclusions of the inspector are material to the consideration of the application before the committee tonight. So I'll now refer you to the report update which highlights the key conclusions from the appeal decision. You will be aware that this appeal decision concludes that the council is not able to demonstrate an adequate supply of housing to meet its need. The two primary reasons for this is the need to identify a 20% buffer over and above the identified requirements as it has been considered that the council has persistently under-delivered against its need. Um, and the second point is that the council should be taking a more cautious approach in estimating when new homes will be delivered in terms of those that have actually got planning permission and the rate and to delivery um, we see from those. Although the council's housing land supply assessment will be updated in April, it is unlikely that a five-year supply will be demonstrated this is therefore the starting point for the assessment of any, this application and future application um, going forward. So in terms of the ins inspector's conclusions on other matters, um, the inspector concluded that the proposal would comprise inappropriate development in the green belt. However, the inspector went on to conclude that the material benefits associated with the improvement to the appearance of the site um, apologies, uh, co conservation and modest improvement to the AOMB housing provision, decontamination of the site amounted to very special circumstances to overcome this matter. The inspector also outlined um, that the car parking demands of a neighbouring site are not indicative of a demand for employment space, rather they point towards requirement for additional car parking provision on a temporary basis to serve as an existing employee use. 
Um, you'll be aware that this was a concern that we raised during the appeal, and it's also raised in your um, raised within the officer's report. Um, however, um, it was weighed into the balance in the current recommendation, but officers would now suggest that the inspector's conclusions overcome any concern regarding this point and the balance against the scheme. It was also concluded there was no reasonable prospect of the site being used for employment purposes and therefore no need for the site to be retained for such purposes. Um, this officers consider this position remains as, as, is, as existing. Consequently, the proposal fails to satisfy policy tests of policy IC2, which seeks to protect employment space and floor space. It also confirmed that an appropriate level of parking was provided um, and suds to deal with surface water drainage are appropriately secured by condition. Just to be clear, the points, the reason I've put, pulled those out, they're matters that have raised within the officer report and the original recommendation, but they've been addressed effectively through the um, appeal decision, or officers recommend that they've been addressed through the appeal decision. So turning now to the impact on the Wilden Heaths SPA, it is noted that the care home would be located within the 400 metre buffer zone of this area, um, with the residential dwellings beyond. In terms of mitigation put forward by the applicants, they propose a SANG on site to mitigate um, the impact of the proposed housing on the SPA, which is accepted as appropriate mitigation by Natural England. In terms of the care home, which, as I say, was in the 400-metre buffer zone, Natural England are content that subject to a suitably worded condition to restrict residents of the care home to have limited mobility and require full-time nursing, the impact on the SPA can be appropriately mitigated. The inspector at paragraph 106 of the appeal decision agreed with this conclusion in that the SANG, which rem remains the same scale as that proposed for the larger scheme and appropriately worded condition to restrict those occupying the care home would satisfactorily protect the SBA from additional recreational pressures when development is considered either in isolation or in combination with existing. So overall, the inspector concluded that the adverse impacts of the proposal did not significantly and demonstrably outweigh the benefits and that permission should be granted. I'll now pass over to Tim to take you through the detail of the application before you tonight, um, which officers consider to be an, o an improvement overall to the appeal scheme and that that's previously been allowed. I hope that has assistance. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Members, talking through the application, um, the site is located off Shackleford Road, northeast of the village of Elstead. Um, the site com currently comprises a number of commercial buildings, which are here. Um, and here, outlined in red, you can see the, the wider site, which encapsulates the Sang area as well here. Um, and also, you can also see its relationship to Elstead Village Centre, which is here. This is an aerial photograph of the site, um, <clears throat> where you can see the, the existing buildings on the site. Um, really to help show you that the majority of the surroundings are agricultural fields. Um, with exception to some existing commercial premises currently in occupation uh, south of the site here. Uh, you should note that there is a um, public footpath um, that comes through through the site this way and out through here. Um, and this leads into, into Alstead Village. Uh, this is a, a close-up of the existing site plan. So it's not very clear on there, but um, it shows you really the outline of the existing buildings on the site. Um, and also surrounding hard standing. Um, there are some pockets of existing vegetation on the site, which are largely on the borders here and over here to the west. Uh, the site is currently accessed by two vehicle access points here and, and here. Um, these are proposed to be utilised and upgraded for the current proposal. So this shows the proposed site layout. Uh, the proposal is for 61 dwellings, including nine for affordable housing, a 60-bed care home, and a provision of sang and play space. Uh, so talking through the site layout, the proposed dwellings, um, as you can see here, will be spread out here. Uh, mainly a, a selection of detached and semi-detached properties. There's one set of three terrace dwellings here. The nine affordable dwellings will be in a flatted form, which will be here. And this is the proposed 60-bed care home here. The area to the north here would be uh, laboured grass, and that would be an area of open, public open space, which would link through to the Sang 
which would be through here. Uh, this is the layout of the appeal scheme, um, as Peter mentioned earlier. Um, the main changes for the current scheme are that the open space I mentioned earlier, as you can see, was proposed for housing under the appeal scheme. So this area is no longer to be proposed for housing, but open space, um, and the affordable provision has, has been reduced. Um, but overall, largely, most other elements are the same. Um, you can see the, the layout of the majority of dwellings is in the, the same form, and the care home is in the same form as well. Uh, this shows you a wider uh, slide showing you the proposed SANG. Um, the SANG includes relevant circular walk and landscape features to allow it to be a usable open space. Uh, the SANG provision is the same as that under the previous, under the appeal scheme which was found acceptable by the inspector and Natural England. This tree protection plan, as outlined earlier, the majority of the vegetation is to the borders of the site. Um, outlined in blue is the tree protection fencing proposed. So the blanket of trees here, here, and down the side here where the road is um, are proposed to be retained. The trees to be removed are outlined in red. Um, a small section of trees up here to allow for the um, open space to be, to be utilised, um, to be removed up here. In their transport statement, they've done a swept path analysis. Um, this shows you the refuse truck entering and exiting both um, proposed access points into the site. Um, the internal road width um, does vary between 5.5 metres and 4.2 metres, which would allow all two-way vehicle movement. Uh, the access points and visibility displays proposed are the same as the appeal scheme. This existing drainage plan, um, outlined in grey, is existing buildings. Uh, the existing yellow area, or gold you could say, is the um, impermeable hard standing on the site. And then the green area is the permeable undeveloped areas. Uh, outlined in blue here, there's an existing coal um, water course that comes to here and then it goes underneath the site in a 600 mil diameter pipe which um, discharges to the riverway to the north here. This is the proposed drainage plan. Uh, the black boxes you can see here are the uh, proposed modular underground storage systems um, proposed throughout the site which would hold water or allow for infiltration. Uh, these would be sited under, under the permeable surface areas, such as the yellow internal road network and garden areas. The proposal would also include rerouting the existing culvert pipe, which runs underneath the site, uh, dashed in blue. Uh, final drainage details are to be agreed via conditions as recommended by the Lead Local Flood Authority. Turning now to some of the more detailed access and surrounding road network plans, uh, this is a proposed southern access point. Two bus stops are proposed to be installed opposite uh, at this point um, with internal pavement here into the site linking up with the existing one that runs south towards the Milford Junction. This is the proposed northern access. Um, again, the visibility displays to be achieved here. Um, there is not to be a, a pavement link between the two access points as this can't be achieved. Um, however, I do go into further details of, of greater access achieved further south of the site. Um, so some, um, some proposed improvements um, to existing pavement which runs from the site. So this is the southern access point here, outlined in green is existing pavement. Um, some uh, tactile paving is proposed here to allow crossings to the existing access points here, which leads down to where the pavement stops and then further crossings tactile paving put in to cross the road here to a new proposed new pavement outlined in red. So continuing that slide, this is the proposed new pavements which would link west towards the Elstead Village Centre. Uh, tactile paving here and here to allow crossings. And again further west until eventually it, the existing pavement, um, it joins up with the existing pavement here. Um, these are all to be um, secured via Section 278 agreement, agreement between them and the County Highway Authority. 
Uh, and this just shows you, taken from our mapping system, the existing public footpath that runs uh, from the, this is a site here, runs through down to the uh, village centre. Turning to some of the elevation details now, this is a street scene from within the site. Um, as you can see, the type of dwelling proposed is of traditional site vernacular design. Um, you can see this is the internal, internal road network, the dwellings that would face east, so some of the ones that would front, possibly vis visible from Shackleford Road. And again, at the back of the site, uh, those dwellings looking west. Again, just to give you an idea of the streetscape proposed within the, within the scheme. This is the proposed care home elevations. Um, it will be a two and a half storey building uh, with dormer windows and the roof elevations. A uh, mixture of exposed brick, tile hanging render and clay tile roof is proposed for this, uh, this building. Turning to the ground and first floor plans of this um, building, um, it would have obviously 60 bedrooms within it with shared facilities on all floors, including lounges and dining rooms. This is the second floor plan and roof plan. Uh, the care home also includes two lifts which it provide dis disabled access to each floor within the, within the building. Turning to some of the example residential properties proposed throughout the scheme, this is an example of the, the single three bed terrace uh, dwellings proposed within the scheme. And this is a semi-detached version. Uh, this is an example of one of the four bed detached dwellings proposed. Again, just lots of gable features, um, very much traditional design. And an example of the, a five bed detached dwelling proposed. Uh, this is the proposed affordable housing uh, flatted block. And you can see a three story building proposed. Uh, it is the same building as that under the appeal scheme. Um, this is the ground floor plan of the affordable housing scheme. So three flats on each floor, uh, two one bed and one two bed here on this floor. Uh, one one bedroom and two two bedroom flats on this floor. And the second floor, two one bed and one two bed flat on this floor. And this is just taken from the, the street scenes I showed you earlier, just to show you a bit of context with the materials. Um, a mixture of slate and clay tile roofs are proposed throughout the scheme. And again here, just to help put it into context. Turning to some site photographs now. Um, this is, as you can see, some of the existing buildings that are, that are on the site. Uh, they're very much of one and a half to two storey in nature. Um, very dilapidated in their appearance. Some existing hard standing on the site that I referred to. Um, a particular note, this area here, five, is where it's proposed to be um, laid to grass to incorporate its public open space. And that's where some housing was proposed under the appeal scheme. And further, some other existing buildings on the site, as you can see here and here. And this is a view uh, southwest uh, along the existing foot, public footpath where this area of land would form part of the Sang and beyond. Um, and that just goes down there towards the, the lane that links to the, to the village. And finally, members, this is a, taken from the applicant's submission. Um, some, some existing built form has been demolished on site already, um, notably these, these large white buildings here. But that just gives you an idea of the of the scale of the site and the sort of it's, you could say former commercial operation. In terms of determining issues with this application, uh, I'd like to draw your attention to the master judgment on the right hand side. The proposal would result in a clear change in, in character to the uh, from commercial to residential. However, the current proposal does propose less built form than that on the appeal scheme which was found visually to be acceptable by the inspector when considering the AOMB landscape designation. <coughs> there are no immediate neighbouring properties that would be impacted by the proposal. Uh, nonetheless, impact on residential amenity does remain a matter of judgement. 
The affordable housing provision is less than the appeal scheme. However, when considering the overall benefits of the scheme, including delivery of homes, redevelopment of a brownfield site, and the decontamination of the site, obviously consider the benefits outweigh this. The appeal scheme proposed a greater proportion of built form than the current scheme, which although the inspector found to be greater over the existing built form, very special circumstances exist to outweigh this harm. So overall, Chairman, officer's recommendation remains as set out in the agenda and recommend permission be granted. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Tim and Peter. We now move on to the public speaking, and uh, the procedure has been explained. So can I first call on the objector, Dawn Davidson. And again, you have four minutes from when you start speaking. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Please do. Big black. So, um, my name is Dawn Davidson, and I'm the vice chair of the Elsted and Weyburn neighbourhood plan team. Uh, we objected to both this and the previous application for no on a number of grounds, including loss of viable and needed employment land, uh, the northern part of the site floods regularly, most recently in 2014, the number of homes proposed, too dense and urban looking for its rural location. Um, which, as you know, is Greenbelt, AOMB, etc. Uh, inadequate parking provision for the three bedroom houses, in particular, which only have two spaces per property, which is lower than Waverley parking policy of 2.5 spaces, even when the visitor parking spaces are factored in. In this rural location, with no alternative residential roads in which to park, it will cause real issues and potentially dangerous obstruction of the narrow but busy country lane outside the site. Uh, the proposal to build additional pavements to connect the site to Elsted Village is controversial locally for the following reasons. Uh, the circuitous road um, to Elsted Village Centre would rarely be used and crosses the B3001 on a dangerous bend. It would facilitate greater access onto the special protection area and it urbanises and detracts from the natural beauty of our rural area. It runs across common land which should be protected and the grass verge left available to provide safe passage for horse riders under the Law of Property Act 1925. Marcus's Triangle is named after and is a memorial to a much loved local resident who died in tragic circumstances and the proposal to introduce a pavement on common land here is particularly upsetting to those who knew him. We suggested instead a more direct footpath and safe cycle route to, um, away from the road, across fields, into the centre of Elsted. However, there is no funded provision for this. There is concern over the impact on the local wildlife, including rare bats and ground-nesting birds living along the river corridor, and concern over proximity of homes to the sewage pumping station, where tankers are known to visit 24 hours a day when there are problems on the sewage network. However, as the first application has now gained planning permission via appeal, we do withdraw our objection to this second application and instead ask the committee to approve it. Our reasons being that this proposal excludes development on the northern part of the site and that the owners have incorporated other amendments following our feedback, such as additional parking spaces, meaning that this application is more acceptable to us than the one for which they already have planning a, 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 a permission. We do still have serious concerns about the impact that this development will have on our community and request that all of the conditions agreed for the earlier application apply to this one and in addition ask that the following conditions be added. No future development on the northern part of the site of any kind with land to the west of the stream incorporated into the Sangs to ensure it is protected in perpetuity and so that it can be effectively managed. Additional grass mesh parking spaces to be provided adjacent to the play area so that children living in other parts of the parish can access it. And a footpath and cycleway to provide, be provided to Elsted Village Centre in place of the road route pavement, subject to Elsted Parish Council approving use of their land for this. No street lights to be introduced on the highway and low lighting um, within the site, maintaining Pepper Harrow's standing as a dark parish and protecting the rare species of bats that we have locally. Land designated for the care home to remain dedicated for employment use only. And finally, we ask that superfast broadband be um, a condition, as this is not currently available in that area of our parish. 
Um, so to conclude, you know, we, we do ask you to approve this application um, and, and to look at those conditions as well. And we would also like um, to be involved in reviewing any other changes that are subsequently requested. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. God, just in time. <laughs> perfect timing. Absolutely perfect. Now call on uh, Councillor Pat Murphy to speak. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, I'm Pat Murphy. I'm the Chairman of Elstead Parish Council, and I'm speaking here on behalf of the Parish Council. Um, I'd just like to say, to start with, that uh, uh, remind you that this is the largest planned development to affect Elston in its immediate area for the last half century, uh, representing an increase of over 5% in the number of dwellings in the parish uh, and associated area. Uh, so it is of key importance to the community, and I think you need to look at it in that context. Uh, several aspects of the proposals have caused this difficulty, in particular the loss of potential employment. But in the light of the appeal decision, we now want to work with the developer to ensure the best outcome for the community as a whole. Uh, we agree with Mrs. Davidson that this application is more acceptable to the earlier one for the reasons she has given. We particularly, wel particularly welcome the exclusion of the land liable to frequent flooding to the north of the site. Uh, we also very much endorse her comments about the impact of the development and the need for additional conditions. Uh, we have particular concerns about several aspects of the proposed Section 106 agreement. None of the provisions have been discussed with the community and indeed we were not aware of its provisions until the officer's report came out on Friday. Our particular concerns are fivefold. I'll just go through them quickly. First of all, the education provisions were not discussed at all with the education providers in the village. Uh, for example, the £40,000 or so proposed for the Peter Pan preschool, they knew nothing of this. Secondly, the £240,000 proposed for primary education all of it is designed to be spent in Whitley or Tilford. St. James's Primary School in Elstead is already oversubscribed, so that all primary aged children from Weyburn would have to go either to Whitley or Tilford, which is a four mile journey. Uh, thirdly, that the draft local plan requires a minimum of 150 new dwellings in, in Elstead and Weyburn neighbourhood plan area, and this reinforces the need for a review of primary education provision uh, to be uh, uh, incorporated as part of the Section 106 agreement. Fourthly, the agreement provides no additional resources for organised recreation and leisure provision in either Elstead or Pepper Harrow, other than an on-site <coughs> on local equipped uh, area of play. This is a major omission. Who is expected now to provide the recreation and leisure facilities given the scale of the development? And we're concerned finally about the permanence and durability of the company to be set up to manage the community facilities, including the SANG. We have seen one such company set up to manage a play area in Elstead collapse recently and the obligation then fell back on the parish council without any compensation. Will there be one such management company or several? What happens if it collapses? The land trust, which is identified as the default operator for the SANG, won't want to take over the suds and the leap. The need for clarity and reassurance on this. Mrs. Davidson mentioned the pedestrian access to Elsin, and we have proposed an alternative which is much more satisfactory. Overall, we're glad that the uncertainty over the use of this site, vacant and derelict now for nine years, will shortly be resolved. But the important issues that Mrs. Davidson and I have raised over the conditions of consent should be properly addressed in the Section 106 agreement. Very happy to work with the developer and Waverley Borough Council on this. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Just a bit over. 
Could you just hit the button, please, to switch off? And I call on the uh, supporter, please, Mark Russell. Again, Mr. Russell, you have four minutes. Councillors, uh, my name is Mark Russell, owner and developer of Weyburn Works. Um, Weyburn Works is a dilapidated and contaminated brownfield site. It cannot be redeveloped solely for employment uses, as the revenues generated by speculative, purely industrial redevelopment is in a secondary commercial location will not pay for the substantial demolition and decontamination costs. The only way to demolish, decontaminate and bring the site back into good economic use is via a residential-led mixed-use scheme. <clears throat> we present a high-quality residential-led scheme offering primarily family housing, including nine affordable homes, together with a care home, offering, offering a range of employment opportunities for which we already have significant interest. We will, in addition, give back to the community 16 acres, 6.8 hectares, of suitable alternative natural green space for the benefit of the residents and visitors in perpetuity and managed by the Land Trust. The proposed level of affordable housing is the maximum that can be provided given the reduction in the proposed number of homes because the significant cost of the site-wide demolition and de decontamination remains exactly the same. This level of affordable housing provision is supported by a robust viability appraisal. Given that the original 69 home scheme already has a clean full consent by appeal, as I'm sure you now know, the real choice here is between the 69 home appeal scheme and the 61 home scheme now before the committee. The revised scheme has responded to community suggestions and for this reason is the scheme we wish to develop if the committee resolves to grant a consent this evening. The appeal scheme before you, compared with the successfully appealed 69 unit scheme, one, removes all 10 units from the northern car park, which the local community felt would have an adverse impact on the views of the Greenbelt. Two, includes a landscaped locally equipped area of play for the benefit of residents and visitors' children. This will mean that the views north from the footpath public footpath will no longer be impeded by housing. Three, we have included substantial visitor parking for both the housing and the Sangs land. Four, we have incorporated low impact post and rail fencing rather than high level close boarded panel fencing to retain the countryside feel. And five, we are proposing low impact lighting in a dark parish. Furthermore, number six, the culvert will remain closed as requested uh, by the Parish Council. And number seven, in response to Dawn's um, point, we will support a direct footpath to the village in lieu of the road, uh, the road route, um, should that be supported by the local authority. I very much hope that uh, councillors will su support the scheme before you this evening, formulated in response to local concerns and our preferred development. I don't want to take up your time dealing with the complex planning issues because following the success of the 69 Home Appeal Scheme, it's a simple choice between that scheme and the lower density 61 Home Scheme before you now, which incorporates a better housing mix, visitor parking, uh, and ch children's play equipment in lieu of housing in the Northern Car Park. Following uh, the appeal, there are really no uh, reasonable grounds for refusal as acknowledged by your officers. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Russell. Members, I now open it up uh, to you. Councillor Coburn. I was looking around in case the ward member wanted to go first. So was, are you sure? I mean, you know, I mean, I know I drive past this on a daily basis, but it isn't in my ward. Um, I'm really quite delighted with the public speakers because they said more or less 
what I was feeling. And, you know, I was sort of expecting you to come out and say, no, no, this is still absolutely awful, we can't take it. But what does seem a little bit disappointing is that there doesn't seem to have been 100% consultation. Now, I know when we have consultation, we don't always get what we want, but it strikes me that uh, this is a much more acceptable uh, application for both the, uh, the local uh, residents and uh, the councillors, uh, and also, as I say, looking at it from our point of view. But it strikes me there are still some bits that, that I would have difficulty with. And I, I think most of us on this committee have seen so many of these uh, schemes on the outskirts of a settlement, and we're always worried about the urbanization of this and the use of materials and the hard standing, all the things that you don't normally see are on an, uh, an out-of-town site, an out-of-village in this case site. So I think it is important that we still have a lot of work between the developer and the community and I'm hoping I'm hearing from both sides that that's what's going to happen. Because I think, you know, given what the inspector has said, given the changes already and if we can secure as we should be able to, that northern part of the site, um, that I, I think really we have a, a, as, as good a deal as we can get on this site. It will be cleaned up. It's not a thing of beauty, as we all know, uh, and it, it, it offers some, some much-needed houses. We've always said, long before a, a planning application came in, well, you, you need to be able to walk to it behind. I'm not keen on the pavement. I, I mean, I wasn't again before I heard the public speaker. Uh, knowing that road so well, it seems to go against the grain somehow of the natural flow of where you would go. Um, people, as I've learned over the years, never walk in straight lines and go around corners. They walk diagonally. You know, if you want to get there, you walk there. You don't go there and there unless there's a bull in the field or something, you know. So... I think basically what, I, what I'm saying is that I presume what most of us will feel, this is heaps better, it's supported by the local uh, community, but there are still issues. Obviously, the 106 monies, I, I don't know the details of that, but uh, talk to the local community. They know what the needs are. They know about their local uh, education. Uh, that, you know, These things are always better when they're discussed with the local ward members uh, and the local members of the parish councils because they do know their own patch so much better than anybody else. So providing we can have ongoing discussion, uh, which seems to be the case, then I think we can do something here which will be of benefit both to uh, the community and to uh, the, the site itself. It will actually be improved. So uh, I will be supporting this, but I do have this uh, feeling that we must have much more discussion continuing into the future. Thank you, Councillor Coburn. Councillor Ells. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, well, as the Ward Councillor, as you've heard, and uh, as we've heard from the Parish Council and Mrs. Davidson, locally we are disappointed at the appeal decision. We had hoped to achieve something better here, but um, uh, obviously this now has great bearing on the proposal before us, and, and I won't repeat or, or rehearse the, the various points that the, uh, the two speakers have made. There, there are a couple of anomalies in the officer's report that I'd like some clarification on. Um, on pages 14 to 15, we read about the community involvement, uh, which of course we do encourage, is all very worthy and, and very much appreciated. But I have to admit that I was puzzled um, as to why the applicant should have held a meeting with the previous ward councillor just over a year ago, when the current ward councillors, myself included, would have welcomed the opportunity of discussing the scheme. I then found out, um, looking more closely, that the meeting was actually held in February 2015, and also the meeting referred to in the officer's report with the Weyburn Neighbourhood Plan Group that was reported as February 2016 was also a year earlier in 2015, and that both meetings were actually discussing a scheme that was even earlier than the one just allowed on appeal. So I'd really like to know from the officers how they consider these meetings held over two years ago to discuss a scheme that was never submitted to the council can be considered relevant enough to include in their report. And in fact, the complete community consultation in the application documents is nearly two years out of date and relates to the previous application. My second question re regards our old friend, the viability assessment, which is reported on pages 73 to 74. And I do thank the officers for including this confidential document for our consideration. It's just for the members' consideration, but it was something we requested on a previous occasion. Um, 
on that occasion, a month or so back, an application was presented to us for a development locally, which included a viability assessment that showed that the applicant could only afford to include 17% affordable housing. This assessment was reviewed and agreed by Waverley's independent viability assessor, and as a committee, we were encouraged by the officers to accept the independent assessor's advice, and the application was subsequently approved. With this application, we have a viability assessment that attempts to demonstrate that the applicant can only afford 15% affordable housing. Again, we have consulted our independent viability assessor, who this time disagrees with the applicant and concludes that the development should include, or could include, up to 40% affordable housing, housing. But, and this is the anomaly, with this application, officers conclude that, to quote their words, the under-provision of affordable housing would not outweigh the benefits of the scheme. So now we are being encouraged not to accept the advice of the independent assessor have to ask why. We no longer seek 40% affordable, but 30% would be very acceptable and much needed in the village, even 20%. Um, and according to our assessors, our independent assessors is viable. As I said, these are anomalies, but we are where we are with the appeal decision. The local residents were never against the redevelopment of this site. They just wanted to make the best of it. The appeal decision has more or less taken away our power to do so, and we are left um, as the uh, applicant said, with deciding which is better for the village and for Waverley, the appeal scheme or this current scheme. And like the parish and Weyburn neighbourhood team, I, with reluctance, believe that the current scheme is slightly better than the appeal scheme. I do have concerns about the future residents of the care home who, under condition 14 of the suggested uh, permission notice, are only allowed to be able to walk or move 400 metres. I hope that if their health improves, they will not be evicted. Or perhaps they could be locked in as a historical nod to the boar stall that once used to occupy Pepper Harrow Park in the 1950s. That would be fun for them, wouldn't it? However, the Section 106 monies are to be appreciated, especially the 296,000 towards preschool and primary education. As an aside, I note that 255,000 of this will go towards a school in Whitley, or that's what's recommended by Surrey County Council, who calculate that it is three miles away from the application site. And this is correct. If you're a crow, then you can fly in a straight line. But if you're, uh, we, we're not going to expect our children to walk three miles to Whitley, so they'll be in, on a bus or in a car, and that's four miles away. And I do wish a little more care could be taken to make these reports more accurate. So, Chairman, on balance, I will probably be supporting the officers, but I hope that serious consideration can be given to the conditions attached to any permission, including some of those suggested by Mrs Davidson, and I would also like to suggest that the uh, permitted development rights are removed. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. I was getting a little worried with the, uh, the pink paper bit, but you stayed well clear of that, Councillor Ells. Thank you very much indeed. Councillor James. <coughs> Uh, thank you. Uh, Councillor Els, literally in his last words, said what I wanted to say. Um, and as the actual developer himself said, um, it's a better housing mix. And that's really important because a housing mix is the sizes of the houses. My big beef is that the height of those roofs means that in the future, any owner-occupier under permitted development rights can put another two bedrooms up there, which means two sort of teenage children with two more cars, and then the amount of better mix of houses is not what we originally planned. So it is very important, and I, on page 127, when it says the development has to be carried out in accordance with the approved, no material variations from these plans shall take place unless and otherwise first agreed in writing, but that isn't permitted development rights. So I really beg of you, as it's my big beef, that we do remove, because those roofs, as I said to Councillor Ells, they've got such high-pitched roofs, not like my roof, which is like that, it's 1600s, but, you know, and I can't put anything on the roof, I can't even crawl in it. Um, but look at them, you know, they'll have a couple of windows, even sky... And the one that says you can't alter the roof line isn't good enough because you can put Velux windows and it doesn't alter the roof line. So please, thank you very much, Chairman. Otherwise, if that's what um, has been agreed, um, then I'm happy. But Thank you very much. Uh, 
Peter Cleveland, do you want to come back and answer some of the questions that were put earlier on? Yes, thank you, Chairman. I'll, I'll pick them up in order, if that's okay. Uh, the first point was regarding the community involvement and what's been provided there. Purely what we're, we're reporting to officers, uh, sorry, officers are reporting to members there is what's been submitted as in support of the planning application. We haven't, as you'll, when you've read through the report, given it any particular weight, but that's what has been formed part of the planning application, so I can't report anything different to that. Okay, apologies if the dates are wrong, um, but um, other than that, the, what's in there, the content is, is what's, what's being provided as part of the application. Um, in terms of the viability, there's, there's one key difference, and I know the site you're referring to, which I believe is Woodside Park, which is a direct comparison in terms of viability. Woodside Park is located within the built-up area boundary, largely, where there is a current local plan policy requirement to provide affordable housing. Members will be aware that our policy, in terms of the adopted local plan policy, does not cover sites outside of the defined built-up area boundary. So we do not have a specific adopted policy which requires provision on these out-of-town sites. So we've always brought forward schemes where we've sought to maximise the affordable housing as an additional benefit, but on this occasion we haven't got a specific policy that's adopted to rely on. Aware of the emerging local plan and that's an overall cover, but in this instance we haven't got a specific policy. So that's, that's the, the, the difference and um, in Wade and the other benefits of the scheme. That's why we've taken a slightly different view. So hopefully that's okay. Um, in terms of permitted development rights, that's down for members to take a view. The only thing I would add is the appeal decision does not apply such a restriction. Um, so we need to consider why this scheme or why I think it's appropriate. I think you set it out, but I'd, I'd ask members just to consider that the appeal scheme did not apply that restrictive condition. They're reasonably spacious plots, so extensions at ground floor and things like that may be acceptable, but we may want to consider just specifically to roof extensions if that's of, of a concern, but just to bear that in mind. Thank you, Chairman. I think there's some other points that are worth taking from uh, both Dawn Davidson and uh, Councillor Pat. Uh, Murphy on um, uh, uh, street lighting, uh, super fast broadband, the 106 um, item in particular. Um, we'd like to take those on this time. Uh, yes, that's fine. Sorry, Chairman. Um, in terms of the, the broadband, um, we can't insist upon the provision of super fast broadband. That comes down to the utility provider to provide that. What we've done in, in the past with sites is require a strategy to deliver the highest available broadband speed to the site. Um, obviously, we can't deal with existing issues within the existing village, but we can ask for that strategy, and that's a condition we've, we've used before in the past. Um, in terms of the other sort of Section 106 matters, comment was made about the public open space to the north of the site and forming part of the SANG. And um, we, we can form that as part of the legal agreement to ensure that play area. So the northern, apologies, let me get the plan up so you know what I'm talking about. So this, this area in here, which doesn't form part of the SANG but is public open space and where the play space is, we, we can include a caveat within the section 106 that that is maintained and kept open as open space. So we can cover that off as, as the 106. Um, just want to quit. Um, in terms of the footpath provision, the alternate provision looked at into, into um, Elstead, um, we, we have sort of taken account of that. There's not a scheme before the council uh, before, before the council to take account of to say whether that is fully deliverable. What we have got is a scheme that's deliverable along highway land and the county council have supported. The county council have said they would support, again, in principle, this alternate route, but we do not have a scheme before us to secure. Um, and it does require, as I say, um, third-party land to, to agree. I, I know we've got the commitment from the parish council to support that if they can, but we haven't got that scheme before, before us. Um, I think that covers all the points. Um, there's some other points around the pri early years and primary education. Um, we have, of course, consulted the county, um, county council as the education authority who have come back and justified where they feel the new requirements provided. Is that Thank you, Peter. Up everything? Thank, Thank you, Chairman. Councillor Hyman. Thank you, Chairman. Um, actually, before I start, can I ask if uh, Peter Cleveland could um, 
just pick up the very first comment, really, that we had, which was from Councillor Coburn, who um, I feel very much the same way. That uh, she said that um, uh, she'd support this, provided we can have ongoing discussion um, continuing into the future and changes to the Section 106 agreement. Can we have that? I mean, if you can answer that first to pick that point up, because I have a concern that, you know, we like this, provided there's changes, little changes made, but I'm concerned that none of those changes actually practically can be made, so that changes my, might change my view as to how much I like it. Peter Cleveland. Yes, thank you, Chairman. I think that the majority can can be picked up through the 106 and conditions, so the, the open space, um, conditions around um, managed land and keeping that open. Um, the, the key thing regarding the footpath is, as I said, we haven't got a scheme before you. There's nothing to stop the applicants or the developers who ever take the site forward in agreeing a scheme in replacement of that and then coming back to the council and we will work with them to vary the legal agreement to secure that route. But that is not before us now. We do not have that scheme before us, so we, we wouldn't be able to, to secure it as such as part of this recommendation to committee. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. May I continue then, Chairman? Continue, please. Thanks. Um, yes, I did email members earlier with a, um, specific points of law, and this is in respect of... I mean, I, I've, I've heard a, a number of people say that um, uh, because the appeal's gone through that uh, it's too late. Well, there's a catch-all principle in environmental law, and there are conditions, uh, uh, I think it's conditions 20 and 21, of the um, inspector's uh, appeal decision, which give our officers power over the establishment of the SANG and agreement to the SANG. So uh, we haven't lost all power, and of course there's the, the there's Habitats Directive which has to be satisfied. Um, I did uh, send out an email and it explains um, my position, which is a very simple one really, which is that the best way to kill off the birds um, is to increase the, uh, the um, number of dog walkers in the area, and the best way to do that is to stick a dog walking site right next to your new housing, and that's blindingly obvious, I would have thought. It's the same as if you go down to the coast, you're looking at me strangely, Mr. Uh, Chairman, but uh, if you go down to the coast, you... Uh, how many boats do you see in the front drives of, uh, of, the, of the houses? There are lots of them. You don't see that many around Farnham. Why? Because we're not next to the sea. And it's the same with dog walking facilities. The more, uh, if you've got facilities around you where you can walk dogs, more people own dogs. It's just common sense and it's what happens in life. And so um, the, the SANG strategy that we have, the reason why it's uh, the, the figures that Natural England are getting from their surveys are showing that it's having the opposite effect to intended is because it is. Uh, because they didn't think about it in the first place and we really ought to be doing so because I personally feel that putting a sang on this site and calling it a sang is probably the worst thing we can do for the birds. I did try getting from Natural England the numbers of the bird populations on uh, Royal Common and uh, the site opposite, um, but um, they couldn't tell me. It's as, as if it didn't matter to them, which is rather odd because we've got a directive that's... Uh, we're meant to be that's meant to be forcing us to save the birds. We do. I'm sure that um, uh, Mr. Devlin will, will confirm that we do have a way of consenting development, even where we don't have convincing objective evidence. We don't have a, an appropriate assessment with us here in front of us. Um, we don't. We don't have convincing objective evidence that we need, and we know that. Um, but I'd like you to confirm that we do have a way through Article 6.4. Um, I see two ways of looking at this for myself this evening. One of them is to um, assume that the applicant has put in uh, an artic Article 6.4 application to save him the job of having to do so and just um, consenting it because it is the first time I've ever come along to one of these meetings and the objector has asked us to grant consent to the scheme. Which I do find rather strange but um, it, it's, it's nice in a way, perhaps they don't realise that we still do have uh, control, some control over the development through the catch-all principle of environmental law but um, if, it, if people are happy with it as, it's go, as it is then I would certainly want to use the um, limited uh, allowance that we have for putting housing in place through Article 6.4 to grant consent to this if other members were happy. Um, our alternative is to ask the developer to come back with an Article 6.4 application, which would be the lawful way of doing it, and use the interim to have those discussions that we want, um, to discuss further perhaps the under provision here of, um, or doing away with the under provision of the affordable housing, which I'm very unhappy about, 
um, and, and also picking up on some of the other points, footpaths, uh, other things that were mentioned um, that really I think the local residents would want to um, ensure that they had in order to fully have their support for this. So um, if Mr. Zevelin can confirm that we do have the Article 6 for route available where you don't have convincing objective evidence in an assessment, we could use that. Thank you. Very deadly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I mean, it's my understanding of the, uh, from the committee report, um, pages 117 to 120, and the uh, taken with the consultation responses set out page 35 that um, there has been an assessment overall of the proposal which concludes um, that there is no adverse effect requiring um, an appropriate assessment to be triggered under article 6 and regulation 48 of the conservation regulations um, that is adequate material before this committee for it to be satisfied that the uh, precautionary principle is not is not uh, engaged in a way that um, uh, there is a finding of certain harm which would cause you not to be able to consider this application. If that was the case, this would, would have been set out in these professionally, these, these, uh, these assessments which have been validated independently by, uh, by the Council's own um, audit. And um, further and beyond that, um, we have the inspector's report um, the, the decision letter, paragraphs 100 to 106, and in particular 103, that the provision of the saying will uh, adequately um, avoid will avoid the harmful effects of the proposal in terms of the designated interest, the Wild and Heath Spa Phase Two. So you've got adequate material before you, members, to confirm the position with regard to the engagement or non-engagement of the appropriate assessment stage of the habitat regs. And I'd really leave it there. Um, Councillor Hyman seeks to drag the committee into technicalities and technical detail in terms of the habitat regulations, which simply don't, aren't engaged here. Um, and I would, I would invite the committee not, not to go into the detail that he has put before you the, the, the opinion of Robin Purchase QC, which is directed at in combination effects of a site allocation policy of 850 homes, including the Sturt Road site at Hazelmere, um, where quite rightly he says there should be a site by site assessment. We don't have any argument with that. Train of thought is a very eminent barrister. Um, but it's, not, it's, it's simply not relevant to this application before you tonight, members. And subject to what my colleagues might have to say, I'll simply leave it there. Thank you, Mr. Devlin. Uh, Councillor Band. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I, for one, am quite happy to proceed on the basis of the advice that we've received from the officers. And, and I see that um, the comments from the inspector considering the previous application all seem to seem to be satisfied with the SANG arrangement. So as far as that's concerned, I, I was going to raise another issue. Um, two issues, perhaps, if I may, Chairman. Firstly, I'd like to completely endorse what Councillor Coburn said at the beginning and welcome the, the, uh, the comments made by both the, 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 the local people who were objectors and who are now, in principle, supporting the scheme and the developer and the, the, the comments that they're both making that they will wish to work together to enhance and revise things. And I'd have thought, uh, Chairman, that seeing that cooperation has already been expressed tonight, we w ought, in some words, to get into the conditions or the informative, uh, uh, the, the, the hope that this cooperation will continue and, and develop to during the development of the scheme. So I think that would be a positive thing to, to stick, stick in somewhere. Um, I accept it might not be a condition, but I hopefully it could be an informative. I would like to just briefly come back to the issue of the number of houses and the split between the market housing and the affordable housing, which I personally find very disappointing. We've come down from a 69 house scheme with 48 market houses and 21 affordable houses, which is a pretty reasonable proportion on an out-of-settlement uh, area um, 
site. We're now coming down with 12 fewer affordable houses, but four more market houses. So we've gone up from 48 to 52 market houses. So on that simple analysis, it seems to me, from the developer's perspective, you know, this is a much more interesting proposal. And maybe I'm wrong, but I mean, I think it would be been much nicer. I know, and I know it, I'm not going to vote against the application. Don't, don't misunderstand me. But I'll just express my disappointment that in coming down from the, the you know from nine um, fewer eight fewer houses on the total development, twelve have come off the affordable and four have gone on to the market. Now, if they'd come, both come down in some sort of proportion, I, I'd have thought it had been a fair do. Uh, but it's, uh, I, I just don't think it's uh, what I would like to see in an out-of-settlement out of development. And I'd have hoped in future officers can keep a, a beadier eye on this when market housing goes up, when overall numbers go down. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much. Councillor Monner. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, my thoughts were much along the same lines because there's much about the new application that should be supported, and the support of the local community is extremely important in these matters. I think what I'm concerned about, and I'd be grateful if officers could help me here, is whether there's been any other example in recent times when there's been such a wide gap between what our independent advisor suggested and what the applicant did. I think it's 40% to 15%. Have you seen anything like that before? Peter? Um, thank you, Chairman. I, I can't say I've seen that specific example before, but we've, we've set out the position. Well, the difference is, is the main point of contention is the existing land value, and that's where the, the effectively the disagreement, you probably appreciated that already. Um, but, yeah, that's that's beyond something I've considered before. Well, could you, the, my next question was to refer to the second paragraph on page 74. Which deals with this very point, the main area of disagreement between the viability assessors relates to. I'm afraid I found the second sentence opaque. It says, the council's viability expert states that the existing site value is very low in comparison to what? Whereas the applicants claim other otherwise. Could you just go into that in more detail? Peter? Um, as I understand it, it's, it's the starting point the, in comparison with the base value of the existing site. So for comparison, they've, they've taken that view. Um, that's my understanding of it. Thank you. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but the impression I get is that because the applicants may have paid more than they should, they're now seeking to recover part of that value by dropping the affordable housing. I think I share Councillor Ban's view that we really should be sharper in future on this. And to me, the gap between 15% and 40% should have sounded a very loud bell. And if need be, although I'm not sure we want the extra expense, um, if there is such a large value, our independent experts should be asked to check, is he sure? And if we have this large gap, um, I think we should be leery. And if need be, get a second opinion. If that's confirmed, then I think... I'm afraid the possibility is that we're being taken slightly for a ride. So that's the message I'd like to, to pass over. And if Sims can comment, it would be also helpful. Elizabeth Sims. Thank you, Chairman. If, if I could add to this, um, it is a difficult matter. The, the, the applicants put forward a case, and as you're aware, we take independent advice um, to, 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 to give you the confidence that the figures that they're putting forward can be verified. Now, as is often the case with a professional matter such as this, quite a lot of the time, experts agree with each other. So we don't often have this discussion. But you're right, in this particular instance, there was a, quite a substantial disagreement between experts. And, and we did look at it very closely. We did debate it. And in fact, Councillor Mulliner, I take responsibility. There was the option of seeking a third view. But as far as I'm concerned, we seek an independent view from our regular advisors, we, for a number of, of, of a pool of advisors, we, we seek 
um, the advice on a particular case from an independent advisor, and on your behalf, we tend to accept that as the independent advice. And I think the bottom line is there is a discrepancy, and we were very disappointed that the figures didn't meet. Now, if this was, as Peter alluded to, a situation whereby we had a threshold where they had to provide 30% affordable, as would be in the towns and, and main settlements, and they were therefore under providing on the policy, we may well have been saying to you, on this particular salient point, we recommend permission is refused. But because this is both a countryside site and a Greenbelt Brownfield site, and setting aside the appeal decision for a moment, because we formed these views before we knew what the outcome of the appeal was, we had to weigh into the planning balance whether or not that under provision of affordable housing was so harmful in the balance of considerations as to come forward with a recommendation for refusal. But as you'll be aware, the current scheme is, in our view, so materially better than the appeal scheme. We felt, as is required of us on your behalf of the planning authority, to come to a view whether or not, in the end, even the limited number of affordable homes that were being provided, bearing in mind their case, was that so harmful as to outweigh the other benefits. And we came to the conclusion the changes to the scheme, the other benefits are included, the mix, all those things did outweigh the apparent under-provision of affordable housing. Now, it is a judgment, and we do urge you to exercise a judgment on that point. It remains for you to still have a view on that. Having said that, of course, there has been a significant change in circumstances even since we made that recommendation that um, the appeal scheme has been allowed, and we do run the risk that if this scheme is refused, the, uh, the appellant may well choose to exercise their right to implement the appeal scheme. So that has to be also factored into the balance. So take your point entirely, but just to reassure you, we do look at these cases very, very closely to give you the best advice possible. Thank, Thank you, you Elizabeth. Uh, can I move on to uh, Councillor Adams, please? Yes, thank you, Chairman. Um, I've <coughs> obviously been listening quite carefully to the um, comments that were made at the beginning of, the, of this uh, session, and um, I'm pleased to hear that the developers and um, uh, the parish, are, including Pepper Harrow, are, are working well together, and I think that's very important. We, uh, in planning policy, are um, developing with the parish council a neighbourhood plan, and... Um, uh, we have an arrangement between the Parish Council and Pepper Harrow to help sort that out. Um, this uh, uh, 106 agreement is, uh, uh, is looking quite good, and I would urge the developer to um, take into account the um, requests that the, the uh, Parish Council have made uh, at the beginning of the, uh, in their speech at the beginning of this um, uh, session. Um, the one particular issue I would have is that I would like, um, if we can um, influence Surrey, to um, spend some of this education money on the school in Elstead because we don't really want to increase the traffic queue getting into Waverley Abbey School in Tilford. Um, the new path that's being proposed by the, um, by the parish uh, is, seems to me to be much safer and much uh, better ac uh, it access to the village than the one down the street. I think the crossing that corner in the dark um, uh, uh, on the main road from Elstead to, or from Tilford to Farnham, would be, could be quite dangerous. I think that uh, people don't, it's only just within the 30 mile an hour speed limit, and people are frequently going much faster than that when they approach that corner. So um, I would also urge the, <coughs> the officers, if they can, to um, come to an arrangement with the developers to uh, facilitate the path that's being proposed by the parish. Thank you. Thank you very much. Councillor Forresky. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, it's been mentioned on many occasions already this evening, the benefits of the ongoing discussion, and I totally agree with Councillor Band on some of the comments that he made. Um, we had a very similar 
application in terms of wanting to work with um, stakeholders, including the Parish Council and the Neighbourhood Plan. And I'm just wondering if somewhere in the conditions are informative, a liaison group can be um, established because we found this to be very effective as a way of going forward. And as I say, you've got two applications on the table here. And I think it would give members confidence that going forward there will be this ongoing discussion, there will be going this ongoing debate and there's safeguards against the appeal coming before um, the application that's here tonight, even though I know that that is the viability is questionable there. But I just think it'd be a good way of making sure that there is something that we can do to ensure that this actually happens. Thank you, Chairman. Yeah. Do you want to answer that one straight away, Peter? Yes, thank you, Chairman. Um, yeah, we, we can apply an informative to any decision and when and whoever brings the site forward, we will work with them to try and set up that liaison group um, going forward with the relevant parties. So we will definitely encourage that um, as part of the ongoing process. Thank you, Chairman. Councillor Hyman, I think you wanted to come back with anything new? Um, yes, I mean, I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm slightly surprised to, to hear that we have got an assessment. I'd like to know where that assessment is, but I can take that out of um, uh, after this meeting with uh, Mr. Devlin. Um, uh, and I'm surprised that we've got an assessment which isn't an appropriate assessment, so presumably it's inappropriate. But sometimes things are upside down, aren't they? Um, I was just wondering, really, to, as um, we move forward, can we look or uh, discuss perhaps what additional conditions possibly could be put in place in, uh, in, in line with suggestions that uh, uh, came from uh, Mrs. Davidson and, uh, and, and Mr. Murphy? Because um, it would be nice to capture anything and perhaps we should discuss those before we go to any sort of recommendation, if you don't mind. Certainly, and uh, I would like to uh, recommend that we uh, ask that the permitted development rights is removed in, on this application. I know it wasn't done on the inspectors, but can we do it on this one and uh, take the other points there? Thank you, Chairman. The, the only point I've made, very, very happy to apply that condition if members want to, but I, my recommendation is I think discussion would be applied to the roof and that controls the additional bed space being formed. So we can just apply that specific criteria from... Thank you. Thank you. Any other... Peter. So thank continue. you, Chairman. I've, I've just been making a note of some of the conditions that have been, been raised. So one was the broadband provision, which is one I'll seek members' view on, whether you want that provided to, to secure a strategy for the highest speed. The permitted development rights um, with regards to... Um, classes B and C which cover roof extensions and alterations um, and then well, in the, within the 106 to secure the play spaces to be um, maintained as public open space um, to prevent further building in that area um, and also two informatives for future developers to work with the parish council to deliver a footpath and um, Tim's just kindly pointed out on plan this is effectively the position where the potential future footpath could go from and the layout allows for that um, and also the requirement for a liaison group, and we will take that on as officers as well and, and, and encourage that should, should the um, recommendation be accepted. Um, if there's any other conditions or points you want me to clarify, please let me know. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much. I'm also delighted to hear the uh, developers say that the idea of fences was removed in this site and it would be green boundaries. So uh, that's a step in the right direction in this particular sensitive area. Are there any other points that members wish to raise at this time? Councillor Hyman? So just if I could pick, uh, pick up, I, I noted down here no street lights on the highway was mentioned. Is that uh, picked up and, as, um, and that the land could be dedicated to get? I'm not entirely sure that those are appropriate as much as Surrey Highways. Can we do that? Um, but uh, dedicating the uh, land to employment use, the care home land, I, we might have control over that. Um, and if someone um, can remind me of anything that we've missed there. Well, hopefully there won't be any street lighting uh, on the pavement uh, because it will be moved with the uh, Parish Council's blessing and uh, request. Peter? Thank you, Chairman. Obviously, beyond the, the red edge of the site, we, we can't control what street lighting might be put onto the public highway. 
um, but we could potentially control the, the lighting scheme within the development. Tim was just having a quick look at the conditions just to check whether we carried that through already, but otherwise we, we can control that through, through condition as well in terms of a lighting scheme within the site. Chairman, I haven't, haven't reviewed that. I don't think it's in there, so we can bring that forward as a, as a third condition to, to add um, to deal with that, if that's okay. Thank you, Chairman. Councillor Earls. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, there is a condition item four that relates to a, approving the lighting scheme for the site. I'm trying to be helpful. <laughs> And, and the other thing I did wonder was whether it's appropriate to include the actual play area within the SANG. Um, I think Mrs. Davidson just spoke about the land to the northwest of the stream being included. I don't know if, if the playground is appropriate. I'll take officers' advice on that. Um, thank you, Chairman, if that's okay. Um, I mean, the, the SANG has been assessed as a specific piece of infrastructure to mitigate the development. It doesn't form part of, the, the, um, part of that mitigation. It will directly adjoin it, but it is sort of has a separate um, sort of purpose and function to be used, used as. So that provides a small public open space for play facilities, whereas the SANG provides that circular walking route to um, mitigate a specific impact on the SBA. So they will be combined together but they will be, they will be slightly separate purposes, um, but we, we want to ensure that uh, continuance between the two of them, and we'll secure that. Thank you, Chairman. Councillor Coburn. It's very briefly, as you know, I'm not a great lover of leaps and laps, especially where they're not needed. Um, if we are going to have a leap, and is it a leap here? We've got some equipment. Um, I mean, do we have any way of specifying what sort of thing we can put there? Because, again, you know, when you've got a, a beautiful area and you've got area behind, the last thing you need is a plastic duck going up and down on a spring or something, you know. I mean, what you actually want wood. is wood, precisely. Um, you know, and I, I do feel sometimes that we, you know, we put these things in. Nobody uses them. They rot away. Um, you know, if it's something wooden, something that fits in a little bit more into the countryside, are we allowed to sort of stipulate when we put our leaps in that we can have a tasteful leap? Peter. Yes, thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Coburn. We would work with our leisure colleagues to make sure it's appropriately or appropriate type of equipment that goes there on the edge of the countryside area, so we won't just have spring chicken or anything like that. Thank you, Chairman. Councillor Hyman. Thank you, Chairman. Just one um, thought about the, the the leap and the sang. Um, if you go up to the heat, or uh, lots of dog walking places, you find that um, dogs tend to empty themselves fairly, fairly early on in the walk. And if the first thing that you get to when you're going for your walk is a play area, you might find that the majority of the emptying is done in the play area. And just it would be a good idea for the developer when he's designing accesses and the rest of it to bear that in mind because obviously it would be unfortunate were that to come about. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, and incidentally, I'm not a dog owner, I'm a dog lover. If I owned a dog, I wouldn't have crows ripping up my lawn and one or two other things, incidentally. Um, I think we're just about there, aren't we, members? Can we move to the recommendation, which I will try and get? So the recommendation A is that having regard to the environmental information contained in the application, the accompanying environmental statement together with the proposal mitigation and subject to the completion of a section 106 agreement to secure appropriate contributions towards off-site highways works, early years and primary education, recycling provision, sorry, recycling provision of Recycling, provision of 15% affordable housing, the setting up of a management company for open space, play space, landscaping, suds and sang management within six months of the date of the committee, resolution to grant permission and subject conditions 1 to 40, an additional condition to secure 
play spaces as public open space and uh, a strategy for high-speed broadband um, with the removal of uh, permitted development rights to the roof space. An informed use 1 to 23 permission be granted, plus an additional uh, informative in relation to setting up of a liaison group and, uh, 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 and delivering a footpath in consultation with the Paris Council. I think I've got there. <laughs> so those in favor of that recommendation to grant, please show. Those against? Abstentions? One. Thank you. Moving on to recommendation B, which is on the agenda. Thank you very much. Recommendation B, that in the event the Section 106 agreement is not completed within six months of the date of the resolution to grant planning permission, then permission be refused. Those in favour of recommendation B? Uh, show? Unanimous. unanimous. Thank you very much indeed, members. That completes our meeting. Thank you.